So we've got a couple of word clouds and we just really want you to type your thoughts and it's all anonymous. So we don't know who is typing what. So feel free to be um, perfectly honest. Um, what can we do to tackle violence against women and girls? You could type a word or you could type a short sentence, but just really wanted to get some views from the audience about what we could do. So if you click on the link in the chat and open that up and you'll be able to um, then um, bring that up and type in your responses. You've also got the link at the top of the screen. So pollev.com, Sanchia Alassia 321. Um, you can also do it by text message, um, which is Sanchia Alassia 321 to the number on the screen. Um, so we're getting some responses coming in. So educate, um, men, violence, define, okay. So definitions are important as well. Okay. We'll wait for to see if any more come in. Responsibility. Mm -hmm. Patriarchal. Ending, absolutely, needs to end. <laughs> Still got a long way to go, haven't we? Boundaries, yeah. Violence, system, teach. System is coming up as quite a, a big one there. Okay, define what it is, what it means. Okay, and by the system, I wonder if we mean, you know, the government, higher education institutions, the police. Um, that's how I'm reading it, but um, do feel free to make further words if that's not what you meant. Um, hate, listening, discussing, empowering. Okay, misogyny, respect is coming up quite big. Educate is coming up really, really big. Humanize. Yeah. Educate is sort of coming up the biggest at the moment. Absolutely. Unacceptable. Yep, yeah, it's a crime. Absolutely. Prosecution, consent. Okay. Thank you for that. That's really helpful just to get a sense of, 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 of what you think um, needs to be done. If we could go to the next one, Libby, that would be great. Um, so this is a second um, word cloud. What do you think um, or what are your thoughts on what effects the pandemic has 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 been on women? Um, have you got any thoughts on that over the last couple of years? Has it been positive? Has it been negative? Has it been neutral? What do you think um, the effects have been? We'd love to hear um, your words or your sentences about that. Okay, that seems to be working. Excellent. So what do you think the effect of the pandemic has been on women over the last couple of years? Do share your thoughts. Trapped, okay. Stressful. Mm -hmm. Hard. Isolating. Visceral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not a good thing, I'm getting. <laughs> okay, hard. Mm -hmm. Family, responsibility, time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Values. Mm -hmm. Reassessing, maybe reassessing priorities, perhaps experience emotionally tough mm -hmm. emotionally is coming up quite big okay yes emotionally yeah draining mm. reflection augmented maybe an augmented reality there. Pressure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, emotionally still coming up quite big there. Emotionally challenging time with, with the issues that we've had to deal with as women, but also all of the issues out there um, that we've had to pick up on as well. So it's, be, it's kind of been tough emotionally on different sides of the coin. Okay. All right. Thank you for sharing. Again, it's really useful to hear what you think about that. Um, we'll now go on to a short quiz, just as a bit of fun. Um, can I just check that you can see the quiz first before we launch, <laughs> before we launch into it? If you can just type it into the chat and just let us know if you can see the quiz on your screen. Okay, excellent. So which of these paid practices can systematically disadvantage women? Is it requiring job applicants to state the salary they are seeking before the employer shares what the salary is? Basing new higher salaries on what the previous post holder um, was receiving, allowing negotiations to play a large part in setting the pay or all of the above. What do you think? If you type A, B, C or D. Okay, we've got D. You can type it in the chat or type it in the poll everywhere. Okay, most people are saying D. Okay, yes, the answer is D because all of those practices can disadvantage women because it gives the employers an informational advantage. It perpetuates the past pay disparities and allows factors other than a candidate's experience and skills to significantly influence pay. So yes, all of those, all of the above is right. Okay, if we move on to the next question, please. How many women have left the USA workforce since the beginning of the pandemic? Is it 34,000, 152,000, 590,000, or just over a million? How many do you think have left the US workforce? A, B, C, or D. Okay, we've got some C's and we've got a D. Okay, mixtures of C's and D's. Okay, the answer is actually D. So since February 2020, over 1 million women have left the US workforce and have yet to return. So it's not as if they've left and come back, they haven't come back. And that's a huge knowledge and skills gap that the US workforce must be experiencing. Next question, please. What is the current gender pay gap here in the UK? Is it 3.6%, 7.2%, 15.4% or 22.7%? What do you think is the pay gap? A, B, C or D? Okay, we're getting a mixture of C's and DB's, okay. Okay, the correct answer is C. So in the UK, the gender pay gap nationally is 15.4%, and the government does require legislation for all organisations over 250 employees to publish that. So at LSBU, we do. And ours is about 5.3%. So it's lower than the average, but there's still a gap. And we need to work quite hard to close that gap with meaningful actions. Okay, next question. How many countries have gender pay gap reporting legislation? Well, you know that the UK has, because I just told you. Um, is it four, nine, 13 or 26? How many? Okay, we're getting 26, we're getting B, C. Okay. 
Okay, the correct answer is 13. So there's 13 countries that have gender pay reporting legislation, should be 26, should be a lot more than 26, but at the moment it's 13. Next question, please. In a study of performance reviews, what percentage of women received negative feedback on their personal style, such as, you can sometimes be abrasive, and what percentage of men received that same type of feedback? So was it 6% of women versus 12% of men? 13% of women versus 4% of men? 42% of women versus 21% of men? Or 66% of women versus 1% of men? What do you think the difference was? So we've got some C's. So 42% of women and 21% of men. We've got B, so 13% of women got some Bs. The correct answer, um, I'm sorry to say, is actually D. So 66% of women receive that type of feedback compared to just 1% of men. We can see the disparity there already, can't we? Thank you. Next question, Libby. Compared to um, heterosexual men, how much more likely are lesbian and bisexual women to feel they can't talk to colleagues about their lives outside of work? Is it twice as likely, three times as likely, four times or five times? A, B, C or D. So we've got some C's and we've got some D's. some Bs, so a bit of a mixed response there. The correct answer is C, so it's four times as likely, so obviously a lot more um, than, than male counterparts. And the final question, I believe. In a study, in one study, how much more likely was a woman to get an interview if her resume was pictured with, uh, without her a jab compared to with, was she, was she the same to get an interview? Um, twice as likely, three times or four times? So if she didn't have her hijab on, how much more likely was she to get an interview? Was it the same, no difference at all? Twice, three times or four times? We've got some Ds, okay. Okay, some C's, a mixture of C's and D's. So the correct answer is C. So if there was a picture without the hijab, um, the study found that they were three times as likely to get an interview as if they did. So again, we've got a huge discrimination there. So thank you so much for participating in the quiz and, and in the word cloud. So just to introduce myself, my name is Sanchia Alassia. I'm the Acting Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at London South Bank University. And just want to introduce our panel just briefly at this stage, just to let you know what it is that they do. So we've got Professor Iman Alim, and she's Professor of Biomedical Sciences here at the university and also co-chairs um, GenderNet, which is our staff network. So Iman, would you just like to tell us briefly what it is that you do here? Uh, hi, Sanchia. Thank you very much. It's uh, my pleasure to be uh, today one of the panelists and to welcome Laila. So um, um, as you just said, I'm a professor of biomedical science with a speciality in cancer biology. Uh, and I shared the gender equality network at LSBU. And uh, I was always motivated uh, to do something for women. I grew up, I was born and grew up in Egypt and um, then studied uh, for my PhD for five years in Germany and then immigrated to the United States and then uh, came to England three years ago. So I was exposed to several cultures and um, some of, I've experienced myself some gender pay gap, I was privileged to grow up in a highly educated family, so I haven't experienced uh, some of the practices against women uh, in the Middle East, but um, I know, I mean, I mean, I was shocked when I, for example, heard that there are 94 or 92% of Egyptian women that has experienced LGM. So uh, this made me um, 
uh, prompted me actually and motivated me to work more uh, towards uh, gender and uh, promotion of gender equality. So uh, that was the reason why um, I was motivated to share the gender equality uh, network at LSBU. And we have actually three um, strategic aims. Uh, the, the first one is to foster a positive culture of, around women at the workplace and to create a trans inclusion culture, as well as ensure that intersectional uh, gender equality is embedded uh, uh, at the workplace. And we have several achievements, including the menopause policy and uh, the now working on the gender identity policy as well. I'll stop here and sorry that I took a little no, bit. No, that's fine. <laughs> Anticipating. <laughs> variety of things that you're doing really interesting we have um also with us lucy brown who is head of division for film and television and sees you an associate professor at our school um, of arts and creative industries so lucy would you like to say a little bit about what it is that you do here uh, thanks santia and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and and um, joining a, a brilliant panel and uh, leila thank you uh, for coming to talk to us uh, so my background is i'm the founder of uh, a network called women in screen and um, and i organize a conference called trailblazing women on off screen so i worked in the um, film and television industry for many years um, as a producer, director and, and screenwriter. And um, the industry itself is still um, very uh, sexist and the, the figure of people working behind the scenes, so in sort of the craft roles is still 21, only 21% 21 of women working behind the scenes and only 12% are directors. So it's, um, it's, I've encountered quite a lot of sexism through you know, through um, through that industry and was sort of drawn to set up this network to try and make things better for the students that I teach now. So I don't, you know, they, they spend obviously a lot of money uh, coming to university and they want to have a career in this industry and so they should. Um, so, that, so that's a passion of mine. And um, yes, I'm a filmmaker as well. So I've, I've made a, a documentary during lockdown. In fact, that was one of the positive things of lockdown to make a, a short documentary um, about the um, Hollywood film Thelma and Louise, which celebrated its 30th um, anniversary. Um, I might talk a bit about that later, but um, for anyone who has watched the film, they'll know that there is... Um, uh, a particularly violent uh, sexual scene in there. And I talk about my experiences um, relating um, to that. But uh, yes, yeah, so that's a bit about a bit about me and um, okay. be here, thank you. Thank you, really interesting, Lucy. Um, and our main panel speaker, we're delighted to introduce Dr. Leila Hussain OBE is a psychotherapist and specializes in supporting survivors of sexual abuse. Um, She's an international lecturer on female genital mutilation and speaker on gender rights and is recognized as one of the key experts on this issue um, globally, as well as being a leading and award-winning international campaigner against all forms of violence against women and girls. And she's founded the the Dahlia Project, which is the first um, UK specialist therapeutic service for FGM um, survivors. And uh, two years ago, she was elected as the rector of the University of St. Andrews for three years. So I think your term run, uh, runs out next year, um, being the first black woman to hold the position. So breaking barriers there. And she's currently working as the global advocacy director and deputy team leader for the Africa-led movement to end um, female genital mutilation. Um, so welcome, um, Leila. I mean, we just want to, to give you the floor to talk about the work that you're doing. You've heard um, and seen the responses in the word cloud about what we should be doing to tackle violence against women and girls, the effects of the pandemic of, of women. And we just wanted to hear from your perspective in terms of the projects and campaigns that you're involved in. How do you um, see us tackling um, some of these issues? Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for actually having me uh, here. And as I've said to, I don't know if, who's joined later on, but I, I, um, I just came back from, uh, I just landed from Kenya where I'm currently working on the Africa-led movement. So the work that I did here in the UK was, there was, a, there was always that sense of it's happening people outside of us. So to be working in a space 
where you are in the community uh it's something that i'm still processing so that's i just want to i just want to kind of uh start with that point i mean as you you know as you said in my introduction i'm a psychotherapist uh by practice and i'm also an activist um so for me really this journey started um just be, being a survivor who's actually uh, uh, uh who was uh, identified in a clinical setting and as you can see i have a very london accent and i was someone who actually thought this wasn't that bad and really my work has always been around why has that happened because there's an assumption if you live in london girls like us don't actually undergo fgm so for me it's always been asking that question why does that happen so for me it's um I want to start with language and I, and I every time the work around FGM is mentioned one of the one of the biggest risks we face over and over again is that actually we're not using the right language when we are discussing FGM you know uh, when when that first question on the question you know that that, that survey that you asked but if you were to put that same question how do we tackle FGM I promise you one of the first responses will be uh, work very closely with the community, uh, work with community leaders, respect the communities that you're going to be working with. That already indicates, even till today, we are still not recognizing FGM for this. So, so for me, in order to deal, you know, in, in order to tackle FGM, one, we must go back and actually see the root of the issue, but calling it for what it is. My fellow uh, psychotherapists who are in this call, we, we, we all know when we are trained, we, when we are being trained, we are there to help uh, our clients name what they've actually experienced, not to tiptoe around it. So to start with FGM, first of all, it's not a practice. I think we use that a lot. I've seen that a lot of like, you know, there's a cultural practice. FGM is not a practice. FGM is abuse. It's violence, so we need to we must recognize it as that. And, and, and I think it's really important those of us in this room actually start with it. So how do we tackle FGM? Use the right language. It's absolutely key that we do that. It's violence. It's, it's a form of sexual abuse. Touching a child's genitalia, it's sexual abuse. And if you use, well, with FGM, you use sharp knives, blades, then that becomes a serious sexual assault. So do you see where the problem already lies? Because if you're using the word culture, tradition, you're looking at different interventions in that. You're looking for something else. You're not actually recognizing it for what it is. But by using the word sexual abuse, serious sexual assault, this is a human rights violation. Most importantly, it's a crime. But why does that happen is the question. Why do we constantly use that particular language? Very simple, because FGM mainly affects black girls, the ones that we see on record. We know there's a big, there's a, there's a big uh, number of women in Asia, but we can't, I know there's a research still ongoing on that to get the, in terms of how many women have been affected. But we know publicly FGM affects black women, girls, especially from Africa. So you can already see how the world treats that particular individual girl. And we must recognize that. So we cannot talk about tackling FGM without addressing the racism in that space, uh, gender equality. So this is the intersectionality we are constantly referring to. So you, we can't tackle FGM if we're not calling it for what it is, but, rec but not also recognizing why this is not addressed properly. Because if a blonde, blue-eyed girl was experiencing this, we would not be using the word practice. We will not be negotiating with community leaders. So, because the interventions we've been using, especially here in the UK has been extremely dangerous in terms of a lot of interventions are, let's talk to the religious leaders. How do you talk to religious leaders or community leaders who are always men who are holding that space? Because to end all of this, we must address you know, the overarching problem, which is a patriarchal system. The patriarchal system is led by men. So now, as a, a, a child who's seven, eight years old, black girl child, African child, we, so the way we deal with it is by going 
to an elder member in her community to end or tackle FGM. Well, actually what we are doing, what is actually happening in that particular scenario is we are negotiating the girl's body, which is similar to what happens to her when she's being cut in a same, uh, in, 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 um, when she's being cut in that same scenario. So as you can see, tackling FGM for me as Layla is actually very simple. It's crime. You don't do it. And if you do it, you should be uh, uh, paying the price for it. So there shouldn't be this hesitation in terms of, oh my God, are we going to be offending? And, and the, one, of the, one of the things I really struggle with in the UK, there's this sense of we don't want to offend. We are more afraid of offending an, old, an elderly man than protecting a child. So we really must question ourselves, not the community. You need to question you, why you feel you need to protect the older man who has power versus the child. So that's really the area. So for me, uh, focusing on the system, it's really where we have to start in terms of tackling FGM. But then what did COVID do? See, that, this is pre-COVID issues. COVID has absolutely made FGM worse. Why? Because now girls were being taught from their laptops at home. So there's no way teachers could monitor who's, who, who has been in school or not. Actually, we now know that girls are being taken out from, their, from, from the country, but they can still log in. So now you cannot even prove if that child wasn't even in the country. We know that's been happening. And because of uh, COVID, flights were much cheaper. So getting FGM done has actually become much cheaper. So there's been better access to have uh, FGM during COVID. And all, any, any funding, any resources that we had uh, on FGM was cut, some non-existent because there was so much focus on COVID. Um, so these are some of the, these are just some examples that I'm giving you. But I want us, I want you guys to think about something. 200 million women have already undergone this practice. In the UK currently is 100, 137,000 women. And this is, you know, a research that was done years ago. So we don't really, we haven't even counted this properly. Globally now, it's every five seconds. I think three have been told recently, but I need to reconfirm that because of COVID. But every five seconds, a girl will be mutilated, is being mutilated. But why is it not, not being recognized as a pandemic? We were so outraged by a virus that none of us could actually physically see, but the world chose to ignore little black girls pinned to a table, someone took a knife and ripping off a very important organ of their body. Yet again, we need to check why we have a different reaction. But sometimes, you know, you know, you know, this, this, this theme around breaking biases, actually we need to check our own biases. Check your own bias. Why we had such a reaction to a virus. I'm not saying the virus wasn't dangerous, but why the virus and not girls who are physically being uh, 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 tortured and it's done publicly. So as you can see, the, 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 da the danger is not, the danger is not just the practice, the danger is also that the fact that this is not even being considered as a, as a big issue, it's not being recognized as a big issue. Why are we calling this uh, a, a cultural practice? Because they're black girls, full stop, that's why it happens. So we must address those issues. We must challenge people and give people the space to really think about, wait a minute, why am I not calling this for what it is? Why am I more worried about protecting the older man in the community and not the child? So that's really, uh, uh, for me, those are the areas we need to be addressing. So for me, as a therapist, that's the space we constantly are creating for the women. You know, for one, of the, one of the things I really wanted to, to do at Dali right at the beginning, it was very simple. I wanted the women to recognize what they've been through was not cultural practice, it was violence, full stop. Because the moment you recognize that when your healing can begin, 
but also you can begin, you know, you can, you, you can actually recognize that it was actually wrong. Because, because then if you're, not, if you're not naming this for the survivor, because, you know, the women who are alive, they're survivors, they're survivors, they're not victims, then you're not acknowledging what they've actually been through. And it's very offensive. And I've seen this many times where people are saying to FGM survivors, oh, you know, it's not like, uh, it's not like domestic violence, it's not like rape. Then what are we saying to these women? That their violence is different based on their skin color or where they're from? So I think it's really important for us to really reflect on this. So if I quickly just talk about what led me to my work, uh, my current work in Africa. So one of the things we did here in the UK, uh, which was uh, funding that was launched by DFID, where, I mean, the UK happens to be, you know, what are the biggest, you know, what, what are the biggest donors of ending FGM globally? On paper, right? That's what it is. And obviously we knew there's a diaspora community here. So it was important to be doing a, a link work between here and, and the diaspora. So this is, well, this is the work, this is the project we call the Girl Generation. So this is an Africa-led movement. So the Girl Generation, it's made up of five consortiums, five partners who came together to support the existing, to support the existing movement. What, what I mean by that is we come in and support the frontline activists. So that's really important. That we don't take up space from others, that we actually are the backbone, you know, if, if that means, do we need to bring more money to that space? Do we need to bring in more resources or other experts? But it's recognizing Africa, Africa already has a massive, massive um, movement that's happening right now, even with this very current uh, uh, um, uh, pandemic that we just, hopefully it's ending from what I'm, here, what I'm hearing. But if I tell you a quick story, one of the things that happened during the pandemic, I started running a emotional well-being calls for a lot of the frontline activists. Some of the African countries, uh, safe houses were actually closed down because they were considered a place of gathering. So the girls who run away from home in terms of uh, uh, f running away from uh, uh, FGM, uh, for example, in Kenya, FGM is very much connected. I don't like to use this word, but let me just use it just so people can understand. Child marriage, I hate that word, by the way. Again, language is so important. A child can never be married. It's child abuse. They, they, this is a pedophile, molesting a child. So that has a whole different connotation. So in, in Kenya, there's a very much link. When a girl's cut, two, three days later, she's married off. So these girls were now taken back to their families. And unfortunately, a lot of them have been cut. Have been, so it was really difficult to really keep hearing these stories. So currently at the Girl Generation, one of the first things that we actually implemented and actually started is a program called the Survivors-Led Training. Because we recognize in any movement where we are dealing with uh, violence against women, we all know the people at the forefront are the survivors, those who survived that particular violence that they experienced. But what we also recognized Survivors are, are very much uh, exploited in that space. They're not supported properly. They are constantly put in a position where they have to tell their story and are triggered, but there isn't the appropriate support for them. And I'm, and I'm speaking from experience because, you know, not, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm here speaking as a therapist, but I'm also a survivor of this. But for me, I, you know, trained as a therapist, I, I learned how to keep those boundaries, but not all survivors do. So with this current program, for us, it was important to actually build the capacity of, of, of the survivors, you know, teach them about well-being. You know, mental health is so critical uh, when we're doing this work. So this is really at the forefront of our work now, the girl generation. But then linking that with safeguarding. For example, you know, we are ensuring the organizations and our networks that we don't use pictures of a girl's genitalia or a girl who's been cut so we really are mindful so we are trying this is a, we're now creating a space where survivors will be uh, protected but also ensuring those who are leading the work are safeguarding themselves and those they're working for so in a nutshell that's the work i'm doing currently 
in uh, Kenya. Uh, unfortunately, last year, obviously, again, because of uh, the pandemic, uh, our budgets were cut drastically. But we just recently got some of that funding back. So we're going to be we're going to be working in other countries in Africa. I know we're going to be working in Senegal, uh, maybe Ethiopia, which I think uh, I think is and I'm hoping, you know, we can grow to other countries. But the, the, the key thing here is when I'm in that space, I'm very aware that I'm a woman from the diaspora. <laughs> I look African. I'm from Somalia, but my accent and my passport says something else. So it's very important when you are in these spaces and supporting a lot of these organizations and movement that you do recognize your privilege. It's absolutely key that you recognize your privilege. And then what we do, especially when working in Africa, you have to be very mindful that you're not bringing your colonial uh, 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 privileges, as they call it, or, or practices in that space, because then you're creating more emotional violence, because that's what we're doing. Especially, it really concerns me in the world of development. There's a lot of that that goes on. So in a nutshell, I want to give people a chance to uh, <laughs> ask me questions. So really, that's where I'm at with this work. But for me, yeah. language mm. is very critical. Addressing mm. the system, FGM continues because we are dealing with racism, mm. because we are dealing with patriarchy. Mm. But, but it affects the Black African girl child who is recognized as the most vulnerable Human being, human being globally. So until we name those things, we can't actually get to the solution of this. Because mm. what we are doing, especially if I talk about Britain specifically, there's this sense and fear of even talking about FGM in case you offend the older man in my community. So we must challenge the gatekeepers, you know, to say, why, why, why are you talking to the religious leader? Why, why are you talking to the women? Even this program, the, the, the girl generation, when we were putting, when we were designing it, we were very clear. It was a very, it was a feminist, girl-centered uh, uh, program. And it's, and it's still a challenge. Everywhere we go, they're like, but uh, where are the men? Well, I said, well, men are, men are part of the conversation, but they're not going to be at the front of this. And, I, and we won't apologize for that. Men have to be part of the conversation. They are, but they're not going to hijack that space as well. So it's very important to, so for me, it's, it's not one way, it's not tackling just with one uh, intervention. It's actually for me, you have to go to the foundation first and work from there. Because if you don't recognize it, it's offensive every time I'm in a room and someone says to me, oh, isn't this your culture, what you went through? No, actually, I was violated as a child. You know, when I went to therapy, I was dealing with early childhood trauma. But you would never hear that, that conversation when we are talking about FGM. Um, so yeah, so I think that's that's really what I want to say. And actually, I have two of my colleagues on this, you know, call, Cabby and, and Christine, who we when we, we developed, you know, this uh, uh, clinical guide on how we work with FGM survivors, it didn't exist, and we had to do it out of our own time. <laughs> so that's when you said earlier there was the last question was uh, what was the last question on the survey in regards to um, what what was the question again? I remember the answer, but I just forgot the question. <laughs> One second, yeah just get the survey up the last question was about um the interview and um if a woman um has a picture on her cv mm. with a hijab or without a hijab what was the likelihood of getting the interview no that was not the question i think i think had no, it was how to tackle it was the first question so how to oh, tackle the word cloud how, how do, yeah the word cloud how do we tackle violence against women and girls there's yeah. no resources so when we created that those guidelines there was no money for it because black women, black girls are rather back back. Women are already out on the back. But when you are, your skin is different, you're right at the back. So no one even considers to think, oh my God, this is such an important word and that's needed. So it, 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 tackling it, it has to come in different steps. But for me, language is absolutely critical because then we're not doing the women or the girls were affected by this any favors by not calling it for what it is why why would we use that if it was a white girl but not for black girls so i'll stop there thank you no <laughs> taking a bit of time it's great to hear about obviously the enormity um, and important work that you're doing leila um and i, I think i'll ask lucy and iman to give some reflections but i'll, I'll give mine first because you know, absolutely, you talked about the language and, and the assumptions that we make. So particularly for those 
living maybe in London that you know this is not an issue for, for people here and, 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 and it's the wrong assumption and how the pandemic has exacerbated because um, a lot of organisations like yours, a lot of charities um, have, have suffered that funding and what we need to do is get that back up because if it's not funded, then it's very difficult to do. It's very difficult to do the work. And you also talked about calling it out. So actually naming it for, for what it is. It's a crime, um, and also you know the intersectionality piece with with, with black women. And we've seen that with Child Q, that international you know mm. young black girl. And would that have happened to a young mm -hmm. white girl in the same way? So intersectionality is really important, and you know really. Um, acknowledging that there still is systemic, you know, and institutional racism and, and sexism, and that needs to be tackled. So I was thinking as you were talking, and I'd like to come to Lucy because she's done some work on this. Um, and I just encourage also people to start typing their questions in the chat if you've got any questions for Leila or, or Emma, um, sorry, or Lucy or Iman, please um, do start getting those in. Um, but I was thinking about, you know, how, how we talk about this. And Lucy, you've done some work, as you mentioned in your introduction, this documentary on, on Felma and Louise that, that, that starts to tackle this issue um, or highlight this issue of violence against women and girls. I, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about that, Lucy. Uh, thanks, Sanchia. And um, firstly, Leila, thank you. I mean, your your work's so important and, um, you know, just in incredible uh, work. And um, I, I had a question for you, actually. I just I've been hearing a lot more about um, the adultification of um, of black girls, um, especially because of um, you know, the recent um, child in Hackney School being being stripped such as we all know really horrific um you know sort of well I guess police violence against uh, against black girls and and black children and I just wondered what your if you had any views um you know on, on this term adultification and, and and how if it does sort of relate to 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 your work that you're doing I lost I lost the sound there for a bit. It was a question oh. for me. Yes, sorry, it was. Yes, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, I, I, so it's I mean actually the 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 one of the reasons so when when actually FGM takes place, you are actually considered an adult from that moment. So the cutting is what makes you a woman. So if you're cut as a seven-year-old, you're a woman. But also there's a sense of uh, uh, not just adult, but also uh, sexualize, sexualization of girls. And that's really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's I would say it's a pandemic amongst black girls. And if I use uh, the example of the R. Kelly case, I, you know, I used to, I was hearing about R. Kelly when I was a teenager in school. Uh, the only reason it was taken seriously, it was when the Me Too movement started. It was when white women in Hollywood made a big fuss about it, it's when now we are listening. And when you looked at that, I don't know if any of you watched Surviving R. Kelly documentary, I really would recommend you do that. But you, what you would see is literally what the question, Lucy, you're asking, it, the reason uh, uh, the authorities didn't get involved, it was because these girls were already considered adults, even though they were 14. But the question is, I was actually having this question with a couple of my friends. I said, I became an adult at the age of 12. And you can see, in my school, my teachers actually spoke to me like an adult. No one actually gave me the space to be a child, but no one asked the question, why was she presenting these behaviors of being an adult? Because it comes from a place of trauma, a place of surviving. So we must, again, challenge instead of just being, but the problem is we accept when this is a black child, but then when, from my experience, when it's a white girl who's 15, there's an outrage in the same example. It wouldn't even be allowed to happen. And if it does, it's, you know, it's not the same. So that, that, that is definitely a massive issue, not just uh, the fact that it's seen as adults, but also uh, extremely sexualized in that space. There's extreme sexualization of black African girls all the time. And one of the reasons FGM is, happens in those communities is to suppress their sexual desires. You're not supposed to be a sexual being. So you can imagine the battle. Uh, uh, I don't want to be an adult, but I've been forced to be an adult. 
I can't feel sexy because I'm going to be sexualized in that space. Because it, it could be very violent for black girls in that space. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think I think also awareness of these issues are just mm. of paramount importance. So. Um, mm -hmm. You know, hopefully things will change and as you said as well the importance of investment is really crucial mm. because lip service won't um you know won't do anything and um Sancha to answer your kind of previous um point so um yes yeah, so I made a documentary last year a short documentary about um Thelma and Louise I don't know whether anyone has seen that film or is aware of of that um film and yeah, yeah. So for me, that's um, that's now thirty years old. But when I went to see uh, the film uh, with my best friend of, of the time, um, you know, we we felt sort of really um, sort of wow. This is the first time we've seen um, you know women um, take you know making taking a stand, doing something, going on this sort of you know road road sort of buddy movie whatever you want to call it and um, where we felt you know this and actually taking action against was a violent action but against uh, the sexual act that happens in, in the film but it it was sort of quite transformative for myself and my friend but then as we came out of the cinema um we were brought into the realities of the world that we live in and um you know, this is more in, of an instance of everyday sexual kind of harassment and instances like that, that you often, as a woman, just think, oh, you know, well, so what, this is the world we live in. But it's quite interesting just rethinking how little has changed, you know, even just last year with, with all the, 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 the quite public incidences um, that, we, that we all... Um, know of so this sort of spurred me on to, to to make this film and reflect on it and actually speak to my friend um Tanya who who I was with that night and reflect on um this this event that then happened um that evening um and yeah I think it's you know obviously I accept my privilege as a as a as a white um woman um but the 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 fact of the matter is that um, you know, as as women, um, sexual violence and harassment goes, you know, just goes on. It seems to be you know part of, you know, part of you know the patriarchal society that we live in, and we have to kind of face these things. And I know it's much worse for for um, you know, particularly for for black women and black girls, as as um, Leila has uh, demonstrated. But yeah, so this is. So this is kind of what I was sort of thinking about and trying to draw attention to. And as a as a filmmaker, I think it's quite interesting, as I spoke of earlier, that there, you know, that film is quite a powerful tool for spreading um, messages and spreading the word. But there are still, you know, only 12 percent of films are directed by women. Um, and, and often these statistics go up and down. I think there's currently 16% of screenwriters. And the this means that women aren't really telling their stories and, and trying to, you know, we've we've had Thelma and Louise, which was 30 years ago. We've, I mean, there's there's an opportunity there. And I'd like to, if anyone hasn't said, Michaela Cole is an incredible um storyteller. So I may destroy you if anyone's watched um that is is the most groundbreaking, fantastic um tv series i've ever watched and i actually had the um the honor of of seeing her speak at the edinburgh television festival where she gave a really powerful mctaggart talk um calling out the industry calling out the racism the sexism of that industry and the fact that she had um she had you know been been raped and so i think uh, i think you know someone like michaela cole you know we need to create these opportunities as well for more um, women of all dif different backgrounds to be able to tell their stories because I think obviously it's not the only solution but I'd certainly think that um, you know there are opportunities through um, storytelling through films to highlight um, the issues that that Leila's been talking about and other you know important stories where we can also you know get everyone involved in um, in making a difference.
Thank you. Thanks for that, um, Lucy. So, so Michelle um, asked an interesting um, question in the chat about behaviours um, and whether behaviours differ between black girls and white girls. But I think, um, as, as some have suggested, we'd probably like to flip that on his head and, and look at what we mentioned before was the, the kind of um, the ad adultification of black girls. And it can be defined as a belief that black girls are more independent compared to white girls and they therefore need less nurture, less protection and less support. And that then increases their risk for discrimination and differential experiences, whether it's in, in school or even um, at home. So I wonder um, if the panel have any views on on what we can do to, you know, what we what what the government should do, or local government or national government should do in terms of working with um, the police, with councils to kind of try and break down these stereotypes. What what needs to happen, um, sort of across the systems, across the police service, across our government to to break down these biases and stereotypes that that people are holding of us and our children. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so I just, uh, before we talk about governments, I have a question actually for Lila, mm -hmm. because I, I realize that we are uh, focusing uh, today on black women and girls, but actually the FGM, um, abuse and crime, as Lila put it, is actually practiced in uh, several Middle Eastern countries. As I mentioned, 94% of married women in Egypt has undergone uh, FGM. And uh, also in Iraq, in uh, some areas of Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. So it's, it seems to be, um, uh, you know, like, like in, in this area, Asia and Africa, mostly. Uh, practiced. But what uh, intrigues me is that according to the Egyptian uh, statistics, 69% of the women who have undergone FGM agree to let their daughters undergo the sexual violence. So I think if we can address those mothers and women, then we have solved, um, you know, a large part of the problem. So how do you think, Lila, we can um, reverse the mindset or, you know, motivate these women to, to, to realize that this is a crime. So if the mother has undergone this, but she agrees to do the same to her daughter, this means that she does not realize that this is a crime. She thinks that this is something good and she wants to pass it over to her daughter. Have you addressed the mothers and how do you think we can uh, reverse the mentality. I, 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 I think that sometimes can be a dangerous thing because you have to think, you have to think about the environment the women are in. So I think again, we, we have to use the right language. These are not these are mothers who have been groomed. They're also survivors of that violence. So if you're being conditioned, if you're being mentally, psychologically conditioned to think that's okay. So we need to. So when we talk about mothers, we need to talk about. We need to address it as women who have been groomed into thinking that this is a crime that's okay. So, so, so if you put in that context, you can actually see what the problem is. So, and the problem, again, I, I really worry when this is put on the mother because the mother already exists in an environment where she has no power. And we've seen this over and over again um, it, where uh, there was actually a campaign a couple of years ago, which we, I refuse to be part of by the Home Office, which, which said, be the mother who, who protects her child. No, why can't the child be protected by their school, by, you know, uh, by the council where they live? Why does this have to be on the mother when you clearly know the mother, it's exists in an environment where she, she lacks no power. She has no power. So we have to be really careful when, so, to, so for me, how do we empower those women the only way we can empower them is by creating safe spaces where they can recognize this. Actually, at Dali, one of the, again, one of the reasons we created, I created that counseling service. I wanted women to have a space where they can unpack this conditioning. So they're like taking down these barriers 
because their whole existence and identity is, is to be this good mother who now will have to do this for her daughter. And remember, it's the father that paid for it. So that you can't just address her without addressing the, parents, the, the father too in that space. So we first must recognize these mothers as victims of violence. They've been groomed. I'm not saying they shouldn't uh, be treated equally in the, in the criminal system. I think you, you commit a crime, you commit a crime. You know, you, yeah, you, you can't take it. But I think it's important to understand the context uh, behind that because there, there's literally, she has no power. And I know with the work I'm doing uh, in Kenya at the moment, uh, the Maasai community, you know, these women who are living, they don't even, some of, some of them don't, can't even own the land. I think only recently that's been done in, in, in Kenya. So if you live in a society where you're not even recognized as a human, and I think going back to uh, 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 um, a question that was asked, you know, what can the government do? How do we deal with these biases? I'm actually sitting here thinking, it would be nice actually if the government even recognizes as human beings. Was that, that's that, because the way <laughs> policies are developed the fact that there's no resources, that means we're not even seen as human. And it's really sad because my grandmother, when she was protesting in Somalia, had a banner that said women are human beings. Unfortunately, I have to still carry that banner around. It's really sad that we still have to actually, because you know, if, if, if I'm recognized as a human who has rights, maybe my, my government would actually do the right thing. So that, that's, that's also, I mean, we can, you know, I don't want to go, I, I don't want to go into the politics of, of this country right now. But we can all agree there isn't anywhere in the world where women are actually treated like human beings with basic human rights. And if we put, put the layer of black girls in that space, and, and you know, as, you know the, why, why is adultification specifically on black girls? Because they're most traumatized. They're the most violated. They're the most marginalized. That doesn't mean I, 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 will, I, will, I will definitely tell all of you on this call you know, uh, when you hear people say, oh, you know, that amazing African leader, she's so strong, resilient, go up to her and ask her why that happened. Because something made you, actually, I would love to be not resilient and strong all the time. But as a black woman walking around the streets of London, I'm at risk at all times. So I have to be strong and resilient and protect myself. So we have to be really careful how we even glamorize those words. So it's, it's important. So how do we, again, going back to your question, how do we address those women? They're not, even, they're not in a safe space to even address. I would say for me as a therapist, all I could do was to create a safe space so they can come to terms for themselves. And I think that's where there has to be some sort, there has to be an internal revolution that needs to happen. And I can only do that as a therapist in my space. You do that as a professor in your class, you, know, you create that space where they can actually have a conversation you know, people just give you a response that they were conditioned with. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, the, those, those labels that are put upon us, particularly as women of colour, you know, strong and resilient can sometimes be able to break our own back because, you know, we're human and we need help and we need, um, the you know, the space to get things wrong because we're humans and mistakes will be made and 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 we're not given that space and that's an extra kind of layer for us to deal with now when we did the word cloud um, at the beginning of the session educate came up quite a lot in terms of you know the the responses that people put in and obviously we're a university at london south bank so i wondered what the panel thought if there was a role for education um, whether at primary secondary college or university level and if there was a role what that sort of role would be so i'd just be interested to hear do you think um education um educational institutions i'm thinking now have a role and if so you know what would they be sort of best place to help um do do to sort of um break the bias in terms of violence against women and girls um so I don't know if you think education has a role because that came up quite a lot in the word cloud. Um, so the, the, 
yeah, that, that word comes up everywhere and it can be quite triggering and it can be very annoying and offensive because for me is what are you educating me about what would you mean when you say education you know like if i use the example again what the media sometimes does they're parading you know uh young girls like malala oh get a pen get a book but what's in that book because you know i am sur- i was surrounded by many books but not one said as a woman as a black girl i had rights no one was teaching me about my body in the uk the clitoris organ is still not in the science biology books so when we say education actually uh have you got if you've heard of everyday sexism project by laura bates there, there's actually I, w- I would absolutely recommend you look at her work she did an extensive research on the UK's curriculum. The outcome was is anti-women, anti-girls because of the way the system's been built. So education is always great. You know, we, we, you know, we do better when we learn. But when you're getting the wrong information, you know, and I, if I come back to the UK again, you know, if uh, my school system is telling me I can't play football because I'm a girl, there's, they're not saying it directly, but the system is built that way. You know, girls are not encouraged to go into science. She doesn't even know how her body looks like. As I said, the clitoris organ is not there. So I'm actually, for me, education is important. But what are we educating? It's key. And who is also educating? It's key. Who's, who's passing on this message? So education is great. It could be dangerous too, based on the information that's being given. Because as a Black young girl who went to school here I didn't see anything that reflected me I didn't see no one talked to me about, about my body the only thing I learned in school that people that look like me were once slaves that's it and you can imagine the impact that has on you so education we can't just say let's educate because for me the education in this country was actually very dangerous it's left this sense of not feeling worthy uh, uh, so, so that's really my answer to the question around education. What is it? Yeah. What, are we, what are we teaching? No, it's an important point. And mm. at the university level, um, we have been looking at our curriculum um, and how it does reflect the heritage of our students. I remember when I was at school and I used to hate history. I actually hate, I found it so boring. Oh, Oh, yeah, I remember that, <laughs> yeah. And, but now I find it really interesting because mm. when I read books like The Black Tudors by Miranda Kaufman, mm. I can see, oh, actually, there was a Black presence back in the 1500s, back in the 1400s, but we were never taught that at school. So you're quite right, Leila. It's about what is um, 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 being taught and making sure that the right issues are coming through. And just to talk about the Everyday Sexism Project, because you highlighted that, um, that was kind of set up because it's become increasingly difficult to talk about sexism, equality and and women's um, um, rights. Um, And and so it was set up to to help move us towards gender equality um, by by saying that women sort of um, have a voice and they face everyday, um, you know, incidences of sexism um, in ordinary places. Um, And it was really to highlight that sexism does still exist um, and it's still something that needs to be um, discussed. So it's not a problem mm-hmm. that, that has um, gone away. Um, so Iman, do you have any thoughts? What can we do as a university? Yeah, uh, so there are two important questions. What we teach and who is teaching, as Lila put it together. So we we definitely uh, working now, there are several efforts at LSBU in decolonizing the curriculum and including uh, as well um, uh, many, um, as much as we can, examples from history and from science as I'm uh, in the STEM field. So there are examples from the STEM field about uh, scientists from um, uh, uh, people with color that we uh, have to project and to frame, as well as also the diversity in the teaching staff. So this is what I also observed in, in, in my team that we really represent uh, different ethnicities and, and the students see in us role models. So when they see um, one of our uh, uh, black colleagues or females or someone with color, they can say, oh, okay, I can be also like this person. That's a role model for them. But I also see the education from another perspective, even if it doesn't 
at the moment, I always try to find the positive thing about it. So even if there is no focus at the moment on history of people with color or uh, achievements of people with color, but at least education allows people to be exposed. So for example, I know several girls who come from, um, you know, like rural areas, villages, uneducated families in Egypt. And then they, through education, they get the privilege of traveling and getting exposed to other cultures. And then they start realizing that, uh, you know, there is something else more than the patriarchy, uh, patriarchal societies they grew up in. So education in some extent also, um, even if it's not, you know, like, uh, focused on people of color, but it can give people opportunities to realize what else is going on in the world. Okay, Leila, did you want to comment? I see you are muted. <laughs> She's muted, I think. Okay. Sorry, guys, I keep losing sound. Oh, okay. The perils of Zoom. <laughs> No worries. Lucy, did you have a view? What can we do um, as a university? Just a final shout out for any further questions before we close. Lucy. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I totally agree with what um, everyone said so far. So I think education can be a real force for good, but at the moment it's got a long, long way to go. And it's, you know, thank goodness it's, you know, there's a lot of people doing a lot of work um, to decolonize the curriculum. And, you know, this, the pressure needs to stay on because it does it, it's you know it's a big project and we need to make sure that everyone you know sees themselves reflected in the curriculum and, and instead of feeling depressed um feels empowered and, and that you know that change is on its way um and yeah so I, I know that that's actually a really huge um huge huge project um but there's there's been some kind of positives there where you know there's some exciting changes and I see it even with my own children's um school um, you know, vital changes um, that, that have been sort of quite shocking in the past that have just gone unchallenged. And now it seems like, you know, things are slowly beginning to change. So let's hope that continues. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, Gail has asked. Okay. How do the approaches in man impact on us? So I think it's a question to you, Iman, that Michelle is asking in the chat. So she's asking, I think, how the approaches that you've suggested would impact on us and changes that we want to see and changes in legislation. I'm not sure if you, um, I'm not sure if I quite understand the question, but I don't know if you yeah. have a question. I don't understand the question either, but I think what Michelle, uh, as I understood the following is that uh, the approaches that we, talked about, about decolonizing the curriculum and uh, also diversifying the teaching team. This is like a bottom up approach. It's not like a top bottom approach. So some approaches are coming from, you know, like, of course, this is supported by the diversity policy at LSBU. And, uh, but we also, uh, not all the time, we have to wait for legislations or something coming from top, but as, um, the what we call the 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 bottom part of the of the working um, people should also thrive to make as much as as in their own will and in their own power whatever they can do in order to um, as I mentioned look for example I I do decide on what I teach okay within of course the learning outcomes. But I can get examples from history or from um, certain scientific achievements that reflect people of color. So I can do that. I have the flexibility to do that. And so this impacts, of course, the students and the uh, and 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 the teachers as well. Okay, people feel empowered when they when they see themselves reflected uh, in the teaching staff as well as in the curriculum itself. Not every time I have to you know, like have uh, the photo of this person who has a white person who invented white man, 
who invented this and that. There are several women, whether white or black, who got the Nobel Prize. We can also focus on them, okay? There are also several scientists um, in, uh, I remember um, now um, an example from uh, NASA, from ast uh, astronomy, who was a black woman. We also teach that. So uh, gradually, people will get used to these examples in the curriculum and this will impact us all. It will kind of subconsciously change the mindset and, the, um, and how people view um, scientists or achievers of color, let me put it this way, okay? Absolutely, and I remember watching the film um, Hidden Figures a couple of years ago and not realizing, you know, the significant input that black women had had into space and and all these kinds of, but as i say these these things um need to be highlighted so we don't have any other questions so i'll just ask um the panel to just to give some closing remarks basically reflection on what has been discussed this afternoon so i'll start off with lucy then iman then i'll finish off with dr leila hussein so lucy any any final Okay, um, thank, well, thank you. It's been really fascinating, but also we realise that there's still a lot, a long way to go, and you know that violence, um, sexual harassment, all these sorts of things are, are, are going on, and obviously there's a lot of brilliant work um, that women, such as uh, Leila Hussein, is doing, which is fantastic, and all that needs to be supported and given investment and highlighted. Um, you know, so those, those are really important things. I think education can play a part and must play a part. And we, we need to keep the pressure up because sadly our media is, you know, it sometimes highlights things and then thinks, oh yeah, that's old news now. We're not interested anymore. So we need to kind of keep the pressure on so that people don't think, oh, well, I think it's better now. And, and uh, when obviously it isn't, so there's a, a lot of work we can do, but I think it's been really fascinating to be part of this panel and, and discussion group. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Lucy. Iman? That was amazing. Um, and uh, thank you very much, Laila, for uh, being here. And uh, actually, there is a way, way to go. It's not, uh, I, I, I'm not, I don't think it's in our lifetime when we see uh, the, the, the gender equality, really, genders are equal, so to speak. So when we know that, um, according to this world report of the business women and the law, I think out of 187 countries, there are only 12 who scored 100, uh, 100 on, on the gender equality index. There are several measures, like eight different measures, marriage, decision-making, traveling, uh, pay, whatever. And only 12 out of 187 countries, that's really sad, okay? So we look forward for having 100% um, of all the countries in the world having gender equality, real gender equality. And that we as women, I think we have proven on several different uh, fields that we are capable. We can be leaders and we can be educators and decision makers. And uh, this, we have to focus on projecting this image, okay? We do not need protection, especially in certain areas of the world when they say, oh, you know, you have to have a chaperone or a guardian or a protect, protector, whatever. No, we are independent uh, human beings that are capable. And I hope that this uh, message will reach and will grow, um, uh, I hope in our lifetime. Thank you. And Dr. Leila Hase, you got the final words. Mm. I mean, first of all, thank you so much for creating this space. I think these are th these are how changes actually happen by, you know, you know, those of you at South Bank University to, to I would say definitely one, one of the things we need to do, we need to continue to create these space. It has to be ongoing. The conversation has to be ongoing. Um, for me, political will, unfortunately, it's something that has to be uh, addressed because, you know, they, they do hold power, you know, um, so that has that that's definitely a must. But some, if I can, you know, just but also just in terms of the last part of the conversation, uh, seeing someone that looks like you in, in, in that space, not just in education, the shops you go to, you know, the streets you walk in, it really impacts your it does impact you mentally. Actually, I've been away 
I moved to Kenya October 2020. And I've been back, I think, to London two or three times. And I really notice a difference now of my skin as soon as I land in London, because in Kenya, I see everyone reflects me in that space and the impact it's had on me, on my well-being. I, I, was, I, I actually had serious anxiety when I was coming back. I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to face racism again. It, it, it's there. So seeing your own reflection, it's, it's, it's how we break down these barriers. It's, it's absolutely key that we do that. But also, as a final thought, like uh, something that I said at the beginning, why aren't we outraged about FGM as much as we're outraged about this virus? I think, I think that has to be asked. Then you're challenging, because you must challenge your own bias. I'm constantly challenging my own bias, every space I walk into. I think we all have to do that. Whether you are a professor at university, you work in TV. I've, I'm, I, I've, I've done a couple of documentaries. There were, I, I've also been involved in ideas of a documentaries where I was told, well, actually, we've, the FGM thing's been done. You know, it's like a tick box is done. Um, but I see a lot of documentaries about the history of World War II, many versions of it. So those, again, we're coming back to the system, right? So we must constantly continue to challenge the system and call out what we see for what it is. FGM, like I said, FGM is not, not a traditional cultural practice, it's not, it's violence. And when you hear that term being used, it's important that we create space where we can challenge those who are doing it. So that's my final thought. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure mm -hmm. and really interesting to hear a bit more in depth. I'm sure it's only scratching the surface of, of the immense work that you're doing in this space. So thank you, Dr. Leila Hussain, OBE. Thank you, Professor Iman Aleem. And thank you, Lucy Brown, for, for really sharing. So and thank you to all of you, um, our audience, for taking your time. We know it's a packed schedule and we know you have a choice of which events you can attend. So thank you for choosing to spend the afternoon with us that's much appreciated hopefully you have had your lunch during the session or you can get some lunch and have a great day thank you bye um